Good morning. Good morning, everybody, on this beautiful Saturday morning. Welcome to everybody, and uh, thank you for waking up on a Saturday when everybody would, could be asleep. I think it just uh, shows um, how uh, serious everybody takes uh, today and this day where we mark a hundred days of uh, days, years of. Uh, um, women in law in our country. And without further ado, I would like to call our group leader, Mr. Momo Chuan, to do the welcoming, to do the welcome. Good morning, everyone. In 1924, almost 100 years, 99 to be precise, the satirist and academic Sir Alan Herbert wrote a parody about the reasonable man by describing a fictional case called Fardell versus Potts. I'd like to read a bit from that parody for you, uh, so you'll just bear with me. The Court of Appeal today delivered judgment in the important case of Fardell versus Potts. In this case, the appellant was a Mrs. Fardell a woman who, while navigating a motor launch on the River Thames, collided with the respondent who was navigating a punt, as a result of which the respondent was immersed and caught cold. The respondent brought an action for damages in which it was alleged that the collision was the, and the subsequent immersion was caused by the negligent navigation of the appellant, Mrs. Fardell. In the court below, the learned judge decided that there was evidence on which the jury might find that the defendant had not taken reasonable care and being of that opinion very properly left the jury the question whether in fact she had failed to use reasonable care or not. The jury found for the plaintiff and awarded him 250 pounds damages. This verdict we are asked to set aside on the ground of a misdirection by the learned judge, the contention being that the case should never have been allowed to go to the jury. And this contention is supported by a somewhat novel proposition, which has been ably, though tediously, argued by Sir Rutt. The common law of England has la been laboriously built about a myth mythical figure, the figure of the reasonable man. In this field of jurisprudence, this legendary individual occupies the place which in other sciences held by the economic man and in other social and political discussions by the average or plain man. He is an ideal, a standard, the embodiment of all good qualities which we demand of the good citizens. No matter which may be the particular department of human life which, fails to, which falls to be considered in these courts, sooner or later we have to face the question, was this or was it not the conduct of a reasonable man? It is impossible to travel anywhere or to travel for long in that confusing forest of learned judgments which constitute the common law of England, and dare I say South Africa as well, without encountering the reasonable man. He is at every turn and every present help in time of trouble. There has never been a problem, however difficult, which His Majesty's judges have not in the end been able to resolve by asking themselves the simple question, was this or was it not the conduct of a reasonable man? He is one who invariably looks where he is going, is careful to examine the immediate foreground before he executes a leap, who neither stargazes nor is lost in meditation, when approaching trapdoors or the margin of a dock, who records in every case upon the counterfoils of checks such ample details as are desirable, scrupulously, substitutes the word order for the word bearer, crosses the instrument account payee only, and, regis and registers the package in which it is dispatched, who never mounts a moving omnibus and does not alight from any car whilst the train is in motion, who investigates exhaustively the bona fides of every me medicant before distributing arms, and will inform himself of the history and the habits of a dog before administering a caress, who believes no gossip, nor repeats it, without firm basis for believing it to be true, who never drives his ball till those in front of him have def definitely vacated the green, 
which is his own objective, who never from year's end to another makes an excessive demand upon his wife, his neighbors, his servants, his ox, or his ass. He never swears, neither does he gamble or loses his temper. Devoid in short of any human weakness, with not one single saving vice, sans prejudice, procrastination, ill nature, and avarice, an absence of mind, as careful for his own safety as he is for others. This excellent but odious character stands like a monument in our courts of justice. Hateful as he may necessarily be to the ordinary citizen who privately considers him, it is a curious paradox that when two or three are gathered together in one place, they will with one accord pretend at admiration for him. And when they are gathered together in formidable surroundings of a British jury, they are easily persuaded that they themselves, each and, each and, e and every one of them, are general men. To return, of course, however, as every judge must ultimately do to the case before us. It has been urged for the appellant, and my own researchers incline me to agree, that in all that mass of authorities which bears upon this branch of the law, there is no single mention of a reasonable woman. It was ably insisted before us that such an omission, extending over a century and more of judicial pronouncements, must be something more than just a coincidence. That among the innumerable tributes to the reasonable man, there might be expected at least some passing reference to a reasonable person of the opposite sex. That no such reference is found for the simple reason that no such being is contemplated by the law that legally, at least, there is no reasonable woman. And that therefore, in this case, the learned judge should have directed the jury that whilst there was evidence on which they might find that the defendant had not come up to the standard required of a reasonable man, her conduct was only that was to be expected of a woman as such. It must be conceded at once that there is merit in this contention, however unpalatable that it might be. It is probably no mere chance that in our legal textbooks, the problems relating to married women are usually considered immediately after the pages devoted to idiots and lunatics. Indeed, there is respectable authority for saying that at common law, this was the status of a woman. Recent legislation has whittled away a great part of this venerable conception, but it remains the position. It is no bad thing that the law of the land should here and there conform with the known facts of everyday experience. The view that there exists a class of beings, illogical, impulsive, careless, irresponsible, extravagant, prejudiced and vain, free for the most part from those worthy and repellent excellences which distinguish the reasonable man and devoted to the irrational arts of pleasure and attraction is one which should be welcome as well as accepted in our courts as it is in our drawing rooms. I find that at common law, a reasonable woman does not exist. Well, this was 1924, <laughs> 100 years ago. A lot has changed since then. In that, that change, I can testify to personally, because as I stand here today, I get accused regularly by my wife of being in a class of beings, illogical, impulsive, careless, irresponsible, extravagant, prejudiced, and vain, and unreasonable. And unreasonable. <laughs> With that, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Group One's inaugural symposium celebrating women at law over 100 years. I hope that you have a fantastic morning with us Please sit back, relax, and enjoy. Before I ask Justice Wiener to come and do our opening address, I'd just like to make a few announcements. The restrooms are just uh, outside the door on the right. We've got some snacks for everybody. The waiters will be around for anybody who needs uh, some drinks. And Justice Wiener, I did try to coax Mom Vida to make you a peanut butter toast, which I hear was, has been your best, but unfortunately, uh, I couldn't quite manage it today.
but I did uh, try my best. And on that note, I'd like to ask you to come and do our opening address for us. Good morning, everyone. Um, perhaps in 100 years' time, this group will have a woman leader. Okay, so in 1993, many, many years ago, uh, Group 14 was formed. It was one of the groups that made up Group 1. That group was formed with real and valiant intentions under Jules Brody, and they did the unthinkable. They accepted that women and black people should be welcomed and encouraged at the bar and be able to join high-powered groups as opposed to groups that were simply left to their own devices. One knows about the comrade, camaraderie and the mentorship shown at the bar, and I think that's incomparable, as you will all agree. Nowhere else do we spend so much time and effort training people to compete with us. And it is something to be really proud of. Young pupils and juniors need encouragement and training so that the standard of the entire profession is enhanced. So to all these fellow seniors, or who were my fellow seniors, every student deserves to be treated as a potential genius. I remember that of the best years of, my, of the bar were having a good balance between work and play. As a woman, it was not always easy. We have responsibilities that most men, in those days anyway, didn't have. There seems to be a lot of fathering these days, and men are really complimented on that, whereas women just go about and do it in their, in their way. But when, when having a balance between work and play, it means keeping many balls in the air, but always knowing which matter most. Work is a rubber ball. If you drop it, it will bounce back. Family, friends, and health are the glass balls. If you drop them, they will be irrevocably damaged or even shattered. So despite research showing that 50% of law graduates are women, that many of them are amongst the top students, that they undertake pupillage and obtain the best results in the bar exam, the number of women in the bar at the bar is still very low. When we look at silks, there are 546 silks in South Africa, of which only 63 are women. That is a mere percentage, and one would have hoped over the years that this would have changed. We've had 100 years to make this change, and it seems to me it is very, very slow. I must say that transformation, both in gender and race in the bench, has been much quicker. But one must remember that in order to transform the bench, one needs to transform the bar and the sidebar. Because that is where the work comes from. And that is where women are exposed to the work which they are entitled to be exposed to. Unfortunately, it's become increasingly clear that a 50-50 gender balance may never be reached. And who better to quote than Lord Jonathan Sumption, whom I'm sure most of you have heard of and who is regarded as one of the the top jurists that England ever saw. He put it in perspective when he said it would take 50 years for women, and this was a few years ago, for women to achieve gender equality in the judiciary, which he regarded as a relatively short time, forgetting about the last 100 years. He also warned against doing anything that might make male candidates feel that the cards are stacked against them. The solution, he said, was that women lawyers should just wait, be patient, for another half a century in order for gender equality to emerge. Charlotte Proudman of The Guardian did an interview with him, and what she said is the following. Let me be clear, Sumption's concern is not about finding good enough women candidates to be QCs and occupy top judicial posts. His comments encapsulate his deepest fears that power vested in the old boys' network could come under siege. Sumption attributed the underrepresentation of women in the senior ranks of both the bar and the judiciary to a lifestyle choice by women unwilling to tolerate long hours and poor working conditions. Many decades have passed since women in South Africa began graduating from law school, and as I stated, in larger numbers these days 
than their male co counterparts. However, the GCB statistics show that women at the bar between five and 10 years make up significantly lower proportion of practicing advocates and are hardly represented in the senior ranks of the bar. Now, I have been either acting or in the SCA for the past four years, five, nearly five years. I can count on one hand, well, less than one hand, because it's happened four times, that a woman has appeared in front of me with a speaking part. They're the dependable others, the male silks are always looking to the dependable others for the notes and where they are in the record, etc. Four women in four years in the SCA. That's my court. I don't know what happens in other courts, but I presume that mine is a sample that is to be recognized. <clears throat> Proudman said what, what Subshin fails to recognize is that this is what we call institutional sexism. And both institutional sexism and institutional racism have much in co common. And that is where the concept of white privilege and male privilege come together to create, for those not part of that sector, a lethal combination. Let us now deal with some of the ways in which male privilege manifests itself, particularly in the legal um, environment. As a man, you are not stereotyped at work, like being mistaken for the secretary and asked to make coffee. If you lose a case, you are not less likely to have it seen as a sign that men should not be doing that type of work. You never question whether you receive work based on merit. If a woman is briefed by a man or she's brought in as a junior, it's not seen as her merit, but whether or not the particular person has a crush on the junior, or worse, that she's possibly sleeping with him. As a white male, people do not assume that you got where you are professionally because of your race or your gender or because of an affirmative action program. You live in a world where others assume that you're competent, intelligent, and a person of integrity, whilst blacks and females always, almost always have to prove themselves to be thought of as good as their white male colleagues. In other words, white men are considered intelligent and people of integrity until the opposite is proved, whereas with women and blacks, it's exactly the opposite. <clears throat> In order to understand the, what women have to go through, both at the bar, at the bench, and in the legal profession itself, one has to look at the issue of the imperative of silence, which talks about sexual harassment. There's insufficient understanding of the range of behaviors that constitute sexual harassment and a lack of understanding of the manner in which it impedes advancement. When I was at the bar and I spoke to, at one pupil training workshop, I spoke to the female pupils. Out of 30 of them, 20 of them told me they'd already been sexually harassed. It's never reported to the bar council because it creates a system where sexual harassment has no consequences because there's little, if any, relief for the victims of sexual harassment. They're either not believed, or quite frankly, it is seen as a career-limiting move. So, I was one of the founding members of Group One. It was a great privilege to be a member of this group. And I must say that over the years, I have seen significant changes. Just looking around this room shows me how much this group has changed, and how much it is being led in the right direction, both by Mohammed as well as many of the seniors in this room. Those of you who know who you are have always tried to bring women and black counsel into their matters, often met with the refrain, but it's a commercial matter. In other words, are women and or blacks able to do commercial matters? So, as I close off today, I want to congratulate you all for what you have done in this magnificent room that has now been added to the facilities at Group One. And I wish Grace was here because I'd tell her it is time for advocacy training to take back the helm from Group 621. It started here, it should come back here, and it can be done in this room as they do in Group 621. So, I would like to repeat what I said 
when I left this group in 2011. How lucky I am to have known people who are so hard to say goodbye to. In leaving, I know that I take a part of me, a part of group one with me, and I leave a part of myself behind. Thank you. Thank you, Judge, and uh, Justice Winner has been a constant support and is a constant support to us in this group, so we thank you for that. And as uh, junior female lawyers, we stand on the shoulders of giants, and a lot of them are here with us, and we thank you so much. It's really appreciated. And there's another giant who is not here with us, one Miss Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> and we take examples from uh, our leaders, our, our, our female leaders, and she's one of them. So I'm going to try and demonstrate that example. I would like you to look under your chairs. <laughs> There's something under each one of these chairs. I'm afraid it's not a car, but you get a notebook, and you get a notebook, and you get a notebook. And we're also throwing in a pen. So uh, you can take good notes and advice today. Don't say we've never done anything for you with our group fees that we give to Mr. Mama Chuan. We get notebooks and pens. On that note, I'd like to call uh, Greta to come and uh, introduce our panelists and we can get going. In 1909, in the judgment of Schlesen versus Incorporated Law Society, it was said, uh, it, it was concerned with where, whether a woman should be granted the right to do articles. And it was said that such an admission might equally be used in the case of an application by a woman to be admitted as an advocate, a change which would mean an enormous difference in the practice of the courts of this country. And then, in 1912, the AD in Incorporated Law Society versus Wookiee said, nearly the whole of womankind, by reason of an inborn weakness, is less suited for matters requiring knowledge and judgment than men. Former Chief Justice Neelius de Villiers um, of, the, of the Orange Free State then wrote an odious article in 1918 saying that a revolt against nature is involved in any proposal to allow women to enter into the legal profession. Now I wonder what, the, what these men would say today, seeing these women who we have the privilege to be on our panel. I'm not going to say too much about them, but Denise, and I'm still not going to call you justice. <laughs> And for Yiza, who, who came from this group, who were the women who came from this group together with Justice Wiener, Charisse, thank you so much. When, when I joined the bar, women were still few and far between. And I was often the only woman in the room, in the tea room, in the consultation, and in the court. And then I walked into group one. And I found these wonderful, intelligent, stylish women. I thought, I have to upgrade dressing, shoes, handbags, pearls, all of it. But they weren't just beautiful. They were women that held the room. They were women that you had to take notice of, that you couldn't ignore. So thank you for setting the example. For women like Lindy, and Corsi Thomas, SC, who I had the privilege of appearing with um, in the SCA on one of the occasions where two women at once had speaking roles. Uh, Ceci Beloy, who, who has this wonderful presence on, on the Judicial Services Commission, who serves with me on the Bar Council, and who has done so much for this profession. 
and Kathleen and Lep, who sits, uh, sits with me on the LPC, I think she is the author of the Legal Practice Code. Her accolades are so many, we would spend the whole morning talking about her. So we're not going to do that. But each one of you made a difference in my life. And you've made a difference in the lives of the many women who are here now and the many women who will follow in your footsteps. So on that note, let's kick off the discussion. Um, and I'm going to sit down because I'm not here to make a speech. <laughs> so I want to, can everybody hear me? I want to start off with you, Justice Catherine Sikluan. She was one of the seven female researchers appointed um, at the inception of the Constitutional Court in 1995. And you clerked, of course, for <coughs> Justice Yvonne Coro. And then came to the bench in 2018. No, 2010. Oh, so, sorry, 2010. <laughs> sorry, 2010. Um, and then you've done your duty in the Competition Appeal Court, the Labour Appeal Court, the SCA, the Constitutional Court. You've had a ringside seat to women as judges right from the start of our democracy. So I would like to ask you to speak a little bit about what you've seen as the involvement of of women as judges in, in, in this period? Okay. When I applied to be a judge in 2010, I was one of seven candidates that applied. I was the only one. Um, and I was then appointed. The fight, the bond fight, was between the men, the white men and the black men. So I came in quite easily because I was the only woman on that. But, but I, I don't see myself coming in only, you know, becoming a judge and being appointed as a judge merely for being a woman, but also because of what I can bring uh, to the judiciary. Um, it was, I mean, at the time when I joined, the, the most senior uh, woman judge was Lucy Mailula. Um, and she was also one of the first women advocates to, be, to become a judge. And I think there were about four other women, women judges. Um, at the court at that time, four or five, I think. Um, what was encouraging is after I became a judge, um, the likes of Sharice and others then started, you know, to come to the judiciary, which, which, uh, and put their names up for appointment, which was very encouraging because then that set the pace for women to see women on the bench and to be encouraged to basically come to the bench. Um, I have to say that when I first arrived on the bench, uh, the senior judges, always come, or the male senior judges, always approach you with, a, with, a, with an element of skepticism. It's like, you know, should you be here? Aren't you too young? You're only 45. You could have spent more time at the bar. Or, um, and it's only once they started um, interacting with you uh, did they realize that you were completely equipped for the job? So, um, it was important for me to get to know them. I mean, they were the judges that you know. They were the, the, you know, the judges that were there for years on end that saw you um, appearing in their courts all the time. And then there were a whole new crop of judges as well um, that I wouldn't have been exposed to, that didn't know me, um, but got to know me very soon thereafter. And, and they really get to know you because of the impact that you make in your judgments. Um, they also look to you to speak in your judgments and not just to be a member of that court. You have to speak in your judgments to be respected in the court. And, and that's something that I realized very, very early. It's only when they, re when they saw that I could write as well as they could write and I could uh, back up my, my, my judgments and I could criticize their judgments when they started to respect me. Um, and so it was very important for me to, you know, I don't know, I always felt that women have to work doubly hard to get the respect of their male colleagues. And uh, we had to do that at the, at the bar. Uh, you have to do that at the sidebar. Um, and I certainly had to do that at the bench. I mean, working hard comes easy to me because that's all I know. You know, I have 
good work ethic, and I'm sure all, all us women have fantastic work ethic. And, and in, in, in some respect, I think our work ethic far exceeds the work ethic of men. I mean, I see the way we go prepared to court. You know, we ensure that we've read those papers thoroughly, that we can engage in the, in the, in the debate with counsel. Um, and very often I see my male colleagues don't, you know, um, work up their papers to the extent that we do. Um, and I have to say that, that through the years of being at the High Court, um, I found that the women judges started to lead in that court very, very quickly. Um, so our judgments started, being, started to be noticed in the profession uh, amongst our colleagues. Um, and, I mean, currently, as you look at the High Court, I mean, there are about seven or eight, of, eight um, judges from the Gauteng uh, division that are sitting in the SCA. Um, and the judges that are really, really, really carrying the High Court, the, the Gauteng division, are, in fact, the women judges right now, you know. So we went from being a very small number of judges, women judges, to being a much larger number, and a, a number that are, are, are judges that are really making an impact on adjudication um, and on the standard um, of adjudication. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they, when I also first arrived, I remember um, one of the senior judges at the time, and I noticed for, for two, three um, weeks in motion court, he kept sending me matters relating to uh, family law, and um, at the end of term meeting, I brought this up, and I never ever got another family law matter. There is absolutely nothing wrong with family law matters. It's absolutely nothing wrong, you know. But what the judges did in the past, the male judges, was to basically ply you with all the family law work because they just didn't want to apply their minds to it, you know. Um, they just saw it as, as work that didn't deserve um, the same attention from them um, that it should deserve. I mean, those are important cases. We now have a separate family law division. The other thing is the commercial work in that court. Um, I mean, when, soon after I became a judge, the, the, the company's law was enacted, and um, we, were, we, were, you know, we were dealing with some of the leading cases in our court, and, and I can safely say that a number of women judges in the court we're dealing with that, and we're dealing with other commercial cases. Um, Dunstan Malumbo, when he came in, he introduced something called the commercial court. I was um, not in agreement with it in the beginning, because I remember from the days of being at the bar, there was a silo of judges um, that were given commercial work at the high court, and these were all essentially white men that were over 60. Um, so, you know, the, the, the new judges that came in, like Lucy, the light, Lucy Mylulas, Kathy Satchwell, were not exposed to this kind of work. Um, and they were seen, you know, forever as being um, public lawyers, you know, or criminal lawyers. Um, I just mentioned the two. Um, so I, I said to Dunstan, we can't have this, because what's going to happen is you're going to basically be, you know, farming this work out to the silks that come in from the bar, and that those are essentially the, the male wild silks, you know, that are becoming, have become judges. And then he assured me that this is not what was going to happen. Um, I think, Denise, you would, you know, um, you can say, to say better, but I, I, I do think that um, the commercial court has helped um, bring junior members of the bar, into, uh, of the bench, into commercial work. Um, and it's uh, exposed them to work that they wouldn't otherwise be given. Uh, like Cherie said, the bench reflects the bar, it reflects the sidebar. And what we need is, you don't just appoint women judges for the sake of being women judges. You've got to have women judges that are the right quality. They have, you know, they have the experience, they have the skill set. And, and, and those, those practitioners exist. Um, so there's, you know, there's absolutely no need to bring in inexperienced women practitioners because they're very experienced practitioners. I mean, I see the way my JP goes out to the bar and he then pinpoints silks, male silks at the bar, okay? Um, the Fonda Linders, uh, the late Fonda, uh, Willem Fonda Linder, 
uh, David Unterhalter, were basically who were chosen um, and were encouraged to come to the bench. And I would like to see him do the same with the women's silks at the bar. I mean, I understand that you have to play, you're playing a very important role. There's so few of you, Kameshni, Greta, uh, the others that are here. There's so few women's silks at the bar and you're playing a very important role and you cannot come to the bench right now. But I would like to see in five or six years or 10 years, you know, that, that, that the JPs make this concerted effort to bring in high quality um, women practitioners from the bar and, and from the sidebar. Uh, you know, there's a sense that um, practitioners that come to the bench, you know, don't have successful practices. And uh, Lindy, you, you are one of them as well. You know, sorry, I, I missed you out, but, but, but you are really somebody that, that deserves to be on the bench and would, 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 would um, play a very important role in, in, um, uh, in the, the standard of, edu of adjudication on the bench, in um, impacting change on the bench, both in terms of adjudication and in terms of, of, of re representation and transformation. So, um, I would really see, you know, I, mean, I, I, I constantly get this feeling that we're encouraging male silks to come to the bar, but we're not encouraging the, the, the female silks to come to the bar. And I think it's very important that, that at some point um, you'll make yourselves available and, um, and you'll be given basically the same worth that they'll make silks silks have, because all of you are, 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 are incredible, um, highly seasoned. Ceci, you're one of them as well. You know, so it's that, that this is an invitation I'm giving you to come uh, to the bench. Um, but I think the discrimination, the, the, the discrimination I felt on the bench, or well, less, less so, I felt less discrimination on the bench than I felt at the bar. You know, um, when I was at the bar for eight years, I wrote an article in De Rebus where I um, said that prior to coming to the bar, and I had been a public interest lawyer before that, uh, at the Legal Resources Center and uh, worked at um, some of the research units at the, at the universities. And I was a lecturer as well uh, in human rights and constitutional law. And I said prior to coming to the bar, I'd never felt, I mean, I experienced discrimination on the basis of race um, as, as being a black woman or an Indian woman, but I hadn't, I, hadn't, I hadn't felt the discrimination that I felt at the bar. And and, and where it mattered, because it mattered in terms of my ability um, as an advocate and, and, you know, at the bar that time. And I came in with, with you know, having the, been at the Constitutional Court. So when I came in very early in my practice, I started getting work in that area of the law, um, constitutional law, public law work. Um, but when you reach a certain level in those days, and Sharice would know, Halima, you would know, when we reached seven or eight years at the bar, um, things started to change because you were not ready to take silk yet and your practice wasn't completely one where um, you, could, you could bring in juniors because it was sort of public law work. Um, and, and, and at seven or eight years you found that start, your practice sort of started to change. You know, there was, a, there was a distinct change because there were younger people coming to the bar and um, so despite the fact that you were completely and fully equipped uh, to take on, um, and I did competition law and, and telecommunications law and broadcasting law and, you know, and commercial law. So I, I was, I eventually be, became, you know, I eventually became a quite a diverse lawyer. Um, but there was still a tendency to bring in your male colleagues that had lesser experience than you because they were part of, of networks which you were not part of, and which you just refused to be part of. Um, I mean, I wanted to, I really wanted to, um, I was given, made an offer by Worksman's, and I think at about 10 or 11 years of the bar, I, I joined Worksman's. They asked me to come in and, and uh, be an in-house lawyer, and I joined them for about four years. And I had never worked in a law firm, because I was a public interest lawyer and worked at, at, at the NGO level, like the, um, the, the Legal Resources Center. So, it was important for me to take this break from the bar and to ex be exposed to what a big law firm can offer. And I found it hard, I found it hard being there. Um, 
But I, I, I eventually settled in and I became part of the executive and, and I was able to make change. And I remember uh, while being there, I introduced the, the um, they didn't have a, um, a pregnancy policy. And uh, <laughs> that's something that I introduced. I couldn't believe that they didn't have that and a whole lot of other things. Um, but it also it, it exposed me to the networks of lawyers that I should have been exposed to much earlier. And at that point, I put in place a program um, and I think Webbers and, and uh, Edward Nathan started, uh, joined in as well, and I got the bar to relax the rule where advocates can uh, work from attorneys' firms. And I don't know if that program exists anymore, but basically it was there to, uh, to, to assist juniors between one and three years or one and five years, both black and women juniors, um, to spend six months to a year at a law firm, you know, and be exposed to the workings of a law firm and, uh, and to the, the, the large number of attorneys. Uh, the GCB approved it and they did relax the rule and the Johannesburg Bar participated in this program. I don't know to what extent it, it still participates in the program. But, but that was an important aspect also of mentoring and mentoring is so important at, 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 the, uh, at the bar. I mean, I think when we were young and when we were at the bar, we didn't have mentors. Uh, you know, we had our pupil masters, and they were male, and once you finished pupillage, you moved on. I mean, I did pupillage with Gilbert Marcus, and once I finished, and I didn't join the island group, and I moved to group one, sorry, group 14 at the time, you kind of lose contact with your old pupil master. But there wasn't the level of mentorship, and I know there were, there were Denise and Sharice and a few other women in the group, but there were so few, but there wasn't that level of mentorship that um, the groups provide junior members now. Um, so it was quite a lonely experience, it was. And the bench can also be quite a lonely experience if you don't have mentors. Yes. Thank you. I, I'm not sure that it's working. Um, we'll, we'll get back and speak to Stacey just now about the JSC and, and introducing women, but touching on your point about, about commercial work, I want to speak to, to Denise uh, the Judges Matter website says, Judge Denise Harold Fisher can easily be considered one of the finest commercial judges in South Africa at the moment. At a time when the judiciary is often criticized for the dearth of experience in dealing with complex commercial cases speedily and effectively, Fisher is bucking the trend and producing a steady, steady stream of judgments that impress both commercial lawyers and appeal judges. Now that's quite an accolade. Um, and, and I think, uh, I suppose from my perspective, quite an accolade for a woman. And I, and I wanted to ask you about precisely what, uh, what was mentioned earlier, this notion that, that women are reserved for family law matters and, and, and aren't really seen as commercial, either lawyers or judges. And you, you have a lot of experience in that, in that field. If you can speak to us a little bit about that. Well, I do think that that is a mold um, that women have had to break. Um, I remember when I started at the bar, I made an active decision that I was going to do different sort of work. And at that stage, um, the family law, family court, was seen as the exclusive domain of, of women. And um, picking up on what Faiza says, there was this sense also that the work was a little bit lowbrow, which it's not, because it works at the heart of every society, and it's something that needs to be encouraged. <coughs> and often, divorces are very, very commercial. There are trusts, there are companies. So um, that reputation was um, ill-fitted. But I had no work, and yet I noticed I was getting a lot of family work. And I eventually made the decision. It was hard, but I made the decision to say to attorneys, I'm sorry, I don't do family work. Um, and I wanted the work. And they were aghast. Um, 
and in fact offended that I should refuse to do their family work. But slowly over the years, and look, I would look um, wistfully at a big matter unfolding that had been given to somebody else that I passed on, I think. <laughs> um, why am I like this? But um, I think that an important part of what is happening in the world in South Africa is a floodgates um, approach. You know, often people say, well, you shouldn't do a, a particular thing. It's a, it's a motif that, that runs through, through um, arguments. No, no, milady, you can't open the floodgates. Well, a few weeks ago, I sat in the admissions court. I and my fellow judge um, admitted 12 women. There was one man who came up to receive the address and maybe a little bit um, naughtily, I said to him, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> and um, he did look a little um, like I'm the only man standing up with all these poised, confident women. And I thought to myself, um, this is the floodgates. This is the floodgates. Because they have been opened. We no longer have to feel like we are imposters. Because we need to stand up, and we are, and say, we're here. Some of us are queer. But we have no fear anymore. That is what we have to say. <laughs> Barack Obama, um, who is famously fond of, um, of left-leaning women, <laughs> described the law as memory. Um, he said, and this really resonates with me, that it's a record of a nation struggling with its own conscience. So when we look at the women a hundred years ago that were brave enough to put themselves into that meat grinder, because that is what it is, that is what it was, it's getting better, because we have a sorority now. And we must be activists for one another. That is what we have to do. We have to have a female consciousness in the same way um, as consciousness in other areas takes root. The men are not going to do it for us. I've realized that. I thought they could be persuaded. We have to do it for ourselves. I'm reminded of a case where I was asking the witness questions and he gave such a, a poignant answer that I, I just said, those are my questions and sat down, even though I had a long list still. Um, and, and I feel a bit like that. that um, but I want to, to add on to, to what you said and I want to ask Lindy specifically in, in your, it's, and, and it all overlaps, the experience as judge and, and practitioner and we hear it in the answer. Uh, Lindy, you, you, you've been at the bar for so long, you've been in all of these high-profile matters, and you are an adjudicator in so many ways, in your role as an arbitrator, but also as an, as an acting judge. And part of the theme that comes through is the, is the marginalization that one feels, 
and in the question whether, whether experiences of marginalization influence you in the way that you adjudicate and practice, I suppose. Um, and to what extent is it allowed? Um, because we are who we are when we sit as adjudicators, but there's a line to be drawn. So I want to ask you to talk a, a, to us about that. Thank you. Thanks, Greta. Good morning, colleagues. It's a great pleasure to be here with you this morning and uh, to celebrate excellence in law. That's the topic uh, of today's symposium. Then that begs the question of, first of all, uh, it was well, well timed, this uh, symposium, occurring as it does during Women's Day uh, Month. But then, begs the question, how do we celebrate excellence in law within the context of Women's Month, within the context of women lawyers and judges alike, in a milieu that is characterized by constraints, division, lack of inclusivity, and some such. And therefore, Greta asks a question of me whether that milieu has had an impact on me personally in my career. I spent about 29 years as a litigation advocate, as an arbitrator, and as an acting judge. We, uh, Michael Cooper, my mentor, maybe not mentor anymore, but sure. <laughs> likes to say of me that Lindy, yours is a very self-contradictory story because on the one hand you lament lack of diversity you lament non-inclusivity and related concepts but yet on the other hand look at you you're doing very well no my God, I'm not doing well <laughs> if I am it's not about Lindy, it's about us. Lindy can't be the lone voice in the wilderness. It has to be a group of us, a class of us, as women, succeeding. Being included in the sector to thrive and to succeed. It's not enough for there to be Ceci Beloy alone sitting there, succeeding as, as a, a black female senior counsel. So, when I came to the bar in 1994, if I remember correctly, well, let me speak to, to, to black women because they are not so sure about the other aspect. There was no black females in a council. It was 1994. 2005, Homo Rocker was to be conferred as the first woman in the country status of uh, senior counsel. Had the honor, I had the honor, and the privilege of being so confirmed as the second black female in the country in 2009. Just the two of us at the time. But when I look around, I see Ceci, I see commissioning, and I see, and I see, and I see. But going back to the stats about uh, Justice Charisse, uh, Charisse Weiner, yes, let her see. Charisse, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the stats, I can see you. Uh, merci, <laughs> just retained from, <laughs> from France. Uh, you say to us, Madam Justice, that out of 546 senior counsel in the country, only 63 of those are women. That's, I mean, I mean, unacceptable in the extreme. So, inasmuch as a lot has happened over the past century, because we're talking century now, 63 totally deplorable statistics. That 
cannot be because our people, it cannot be because women lack the expertise. Is it because we're looking to men to fight for us, mm. Denise? I do think that there's a measure of that. I do think that there's a, um, women often try to set themselves apart. One of the most insulting things that an attorney ever said to me was the following. You know I brief you because you think like a man. I'm not going to say who it was. Um, but that is the kind of trope that you must be like a man in order to be worthy of the club. And when I say that um, we have to be a sorority, what I mean is that we can't set ourselves apart. I've seen women do that. I'm one of the boys. I want to be one of the boys. I'm going to do everything I possibly can to square my shoulders. And I'm going to think like a man. And I'm going to act like a man. And I'm going to brief like a man. And I'm going to lead like a man. When we realize our strength, we know that thinking as a woman is a very, very important judi judicial and um, edge in any workplace, particularly in the law. Women are very intuitive, instinctive lawyers. I insisted when I was um, um, silk that I be briefed with women. People say, well, you, you can't make those, um, you can't, the attorney will brief who the attorney wants to brief. No, that is not true. Females must brief females. Female um, silks must bring female juniors into their matters. It is the only way, as I said, Activism. I spoke of the um, of Obama's uh, um, reference to the law being um, a a conversation, um, a nation arguing with its own conscience. We haven't been part of that conversation. We now are. Thank you. Thanks, Denise. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that's where we are. We have achieved certain milestones, but the road ahead is still very long. Let me share an anecdote with you. The past two weeks, I was on active duty at, uh, in the tax court. Of course, my JP deployed me there because there was a role, there were matters on the role that required the attention of a judge. It was not my first time to, to, to preside at the court. As a matter of fact, I had it in the past, I had it down the judgment and it uh, granted leave to the SCA, Madame Pile, I did it. I was over attending part and upheld in part. But the part that was upheld has been followed, it's been followed as we talk. It's about the interpretation of section 222, if I'm not mistaken, of the, uh, what's the act? TAA. TAA. Yeah, did so. So, now, thank you. I'm not blowing my own trumpet here, but I'm just going to share it. Blowing my own trumpet. But with that experience, you'd have thought that the sector appreciates that Mkosi Thomas AJ understands something about tax law. I mean, of course, in addition, one has done work, I did my test at the SCA on behalf of SARS. But lo and behold, those matters, all of them were removed from the law. And white firms 
if I may add. So the road ahead is very long. I'm not complaining. I celebrate the small victories that we have achieved, but let's build on those. And uh, I accept it is that we can't look to our male counterparts to fight for us, but please work with us. We have something, we have a whole lot of intellectual wealth to bring to the party. Allow us. Thank you. I thought about asking the question um, that might rightfully be asked of all of us sitting here, and many of the women also in the audience. Can we actually, any of us, claim to be marginalized? And, and I thought of the question, particularly in the context of the experience of white women. It's an experience that's not often talked about because the entry or the real entry of women into the profession came more or less at the same time um, as our transformation to democracy. And as a white woman, and that's my experience, I don't say it is the true experience, but I often think the experiences of white women sort of fell by the wayside. And so I thought, can white women, for example, claim to be marginalized? And I then thought, can women like Kathleen Glebe, you've done everything and anything. Can you actually claim to be marginalized? And I thought maybe all of the members of the panel can uh, share just a short sentence or two about why why we would claim marginalisation when when we really achieve the, the top echelons of the profession. So, all of us, if you want to. Um, yes. Uh, well, as, I, as I say, it's, it's not about one person, it's about a class of people. And uh, I'll allow other panelists to speak to marginalization, and perhaps I will add thereafter. My guys, yes. pass the mic. Thank you. I remember. Is this on? Yeah. Yeah. I remember a time at the bar. It was um, a very, um, a very difficult time for for women, um, especially women who um, had a leadership role to play. And that is when the Bar Council decided the three council rule and excluded white women. And um, there was an uproar. I personally believe that it was right. I do think black women are the most marginalized um, sector of our population. They're the mar most marginalized sector um, in any industry, in any um, group. And they needed the leg up more than we needed the leg up. I came under a lot of fire. There were women in my group who refused to speak to me because um, I um, just would walk past me in the corridor and turn their face because I was regarded as a traitor. But I do think that we have to understand there are levels. We're celebrating women today. But when you, when you look at the first black woman who, who, made the, um, who made the trip into what I've called the meat grinder, that wasn't just uh, brave. It was miraculous that any black woman at that stage would decide that they wanted to do that. So, um, yes, I do think we're marginalized. I have felt marginalized, but it's nothing compared to other marginalization that I've seen. Um, in, when, I was, when, when I was in chambers, I would see the way um, young, female um, uh, article clerks, candidate attorneys, were treated. It was as if they were fodder. Okay, we've ticked a box. 
So now we have you sitting here, but don't worry about anything that is said. She doesn't have to say anything. What you do is you say, what do you think? When you say that, you'll often find that you get a very wise, considered point of view coming back. And often the men in the room are astonished. Thank you, Greta. I think when you spoke about being marginalized, I had to, you know, I, I got confused a little. went to Google just to check the meaning. Yeah? <laughs> and, and, and for me, we are marginalized. And we have to accept it. And until we accept that we are marginalized, we won't fight against it. And unfortunately, as black women, <coughs> me as a black woman, I've been marginalized so much. You know, I had to fight my battles. I'm, I've occupied all these positions, not because somebody put me there. I fought all the battles. And the, the, the reason why I wanted, you know, I, I, I come from a family of, of, I'm the first eldest child, three women, and my mother was the eldest child of five ladies, and I've got two daughters. So me and I in my family, my husband. <laughs> so I have to do everything, you know, to, to, to make sure that I become an exemplar, exemplar to them and fight for them. You know, I just want to remind, uh, to tell you about a little story about how, when I started. You know, I, I became a, a, tip of the, a member of the PLA at TEFLOP, you know, TEFLOP in the rest of the North. And when I got admitted, and I decided to join the BLA, this uh, elite and uh, the DPJ and all. But then the law societies, you know, remember the, the law societies were a no go error. A no go error. You see a letter from a law society, you, 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 it, 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 you know, you, you want to die. Because we never even had an opportunity of understanding what happens in those societies. When, when you saw a letter, a letter from the law society, you thought about striking or something. And for us, sometimes they just reminded you, please pay your subscription. <laughs> <laughs> but you, 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 were, you were so scared. So BLA, I don't know, because I'm this vocal. I'm very vocal. We know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then they decided to send me to represent BLA in the law society of Changwa. Then. I was the only black woman, and as me, the person was the other one, out of 21 men. And very young. I went in there, and I was so scared. I was so scared. I couldn't even utter a word. But the second time, you know, I kept on raising my hand like this, and then I was me. Nobody actually picked me. You know. I said, next time I come to this meeting, I'll be wearing pink. Orange. Yeah, or, or, <laughs> I wore pink. I made sure that the president of the law society, when I raised my hands, she didn't recognize me first. I said, President, I'm wearing pink because I want you to see me. So this is how we have to accept ourselves. So we are definitely journalists. Yeah. I, I, when, I, when I looked at that, um, impact of um, identity and marginalization on, on adjudication. I was a, wondered, are we really marginalized? Are we still marginalized? I mean, you know, it's an embarrassment and it's shameful, in fact, to think that in this day and age, that women, in particular black women, are still marginalized. But in as much as the judiciary has transformed and you have greater numbers of women on the bench now, um, when you look at the number of women on the Constitutional Court, for example, so one third of that bench, that's, that's women. And then, and then you have to say, but we are still marginalized. Black women practitioners are still marginalized. And for as long as the briefing patterns don't change, and, and for as long as women are not getting qualitative work, um, women practitioners will still be marginalized. And, and I talk to the attorneys sitting here today, there are a lot of attorneys here, 
and uh, there are lots of very competent women. Some we've seen flying their trade in court, others I have not seen. But I have no doubt, to be a member of this group, you are somebody. Um, and you have every potential to succeed, or you've succeeded already. Um, and you are obviously a candidate that will um, mentor other young lawyers. Um, I remember when I came to, to group one, there was not a single black woman in the group. There were one or two black men who had left as soon as I came. I think it was Vincent Baleka that left. There was Denise Charisse and Jane Andropoulos, I think, that were three women. Um, I was the only Indian woman or black woman in the group. There were no other black women for a very long time until group one started. I think even there, there was no black woman. Even then, there wasn't for those first few years, you know, until the new pupil intakes started. But so, so I'm not talking about society generally, but I'm talking about the profession. Um, women are still marginalized, and unless there's a change in the mindset, particularly in so far as um, the, the ability, skill set, and expertise of women go, um, attorneys have to see you for who you are, and that you are, you know, you, you practice on equal terms as the men are here, and you should be given the same quality and um, the, the, the of work that the male practitioners are getting. So I'm sorry to say, and it, it hurts me to say that marginalization of you know women's yeah. existence. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I think Greta, you you asked the question on the basis that uh, as we sit around here, we we are the most senior uh, in the profession. Uh, the Indian I, for example, Kathleen is a senior attorney. Uh, you've got these judges, and the question when you ask the question, as I understand it, is being these senior people, we, we have been promoted to where we sit. Um, you hope that we've got very good practices, uh, successful practices, and can we, are we justified to say we still, we marginalize being this special group of people. I always answer the question this way. I say, I do have a busy practice, right? And a successful practice. But there's lots of capacity that I still have. Um, both in terms of I can still take on more work, right? I can make room for more work. I'm busy, but I still. Um, but also, I can do different kind of work that is more m more than what I'm, I have now. So while I may present a picture of I shouldn't be complaining because it's, I'm, I'm, I shouldn't be complaining. I'm outside of that struggling group. Uh, I may not be struggling, but in reality, um, I have so much capacity, both in terms of what I'm able to do intellectually, uh, but also in terms of what I can still take on. So, and, and maybe let me finish off by saying, Commissioner and I have been participating in these discussions as recently as last week, Saturday. And one of the things we ended up talking about was, she asked me, um, have you been doing competition work? <laughs> and I said, uh, of late, I'm doing opinions. And, and she said, you know, ever since I got to the bar, which was quite a surprise to me, because she's my senior, and, and by all accounts, uh, she's well regarded, right? Nobody, nobody questions commission's ability. Um, and she said to me, oh, Two weeks ago, you know, I got a call, my very first call to do competition work. Very, very first call. And I had made such assumptions. If, if someone had asked me, do you think, what do you think about commissioning and competition work? I would have said, ah, oh, you know, she's swimming in it without, without any evidence, evidence because it's an assumption that I made. Now, for me, that is, when you say marginalized, we're talking about this, you know, that uh, however good we are. Uh, there's areas of work that are completely shut out for us, or if we get to do it, even at this level, you are a visitor in it. Uh, and, and a big function of it, I think, also is we don't have um, we don't have sponsors. We don't. And and I think I think if you ask us around the table, you will find by far the majority 
where we have areas of work that have developed, it's because we happen to do the work. We, we did the first brief, if you're lucky enough, they come back, but, but it's never a guarantee. You know, you, you, you're always the woman, the black woman. Uh, and, and so, yes, even at these levels of, of, of seniority and achievement, we are, we, we continue to be much nice. Thank you. It's interesting that you use the competition law example because I am regarded as a competition lawyer. Okay. And I, I, I think it was yeah, 2022 and I won some award. A very important award. Don't do that. <laughs> no, but the, the, the point about the thing is not the award or me winning the award. The point is that in the week after that, an attorney phones me and she says, I was approached and asked for a recommendation on a competition lawyer. And I gave your name. And the man exclaimed, but she's a woman. I didn't get the call. And actually, I'm grateful. So it's interesting. And, that, and that's the point about the marginalization. And I think it goes hand in hand with a theme that comes through, and that's the notion of exceptionalism. You have to, and I have said this at the commemorative speech in the, in the Victoria High Court, we have to elbow our way in around the table by being exceptional. And sometimes that's not even good enough. So I think I agree, and, and it is so. There is marginalization, and I think Denise makes the point very importantly. It's different degrees, but in different ways and different circumstances, we all experience levels of that. Which brings me to the legal practice code. And I want to ask Kathleen to talk to us about that. She was instrumental um, in drafting that. And I, and I suppose what I'm asking is, our experiences are not about the numbers of women. We know women are entering the profession. We know women are, are taking up very senior roles. Is the legal practice code something that will just be another placebo? Oh, we've done something for transformation. Let's tap our hands. Or will it actually make a difference, especially for women, in the transformation of the sector? Uh, thank you, Greta. It, it, it is the, the objectives of the legal sector code is to open those floodgates. We are going to open them. The the B at triple B at is quite a difficult at to be. You know. Most of you don't know it. I know you defend clients, but going down to the nitty gritties of it, I, I I don't think any of us understand it. And it was supposed to be an instrument to empower the all those historically marginalised. But when we, when we uh, came into the, the LPC, and I, 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 I wanted to be the chair purposely, because I just felt we need to prove them wrong. I need to prove them wrong. I've been proving them wrong, but I'm still going to prove them wrong. But one, when I went into the LPC, our aim was to, because the, the objectives of the LPA is to empower, you know, to transform the profession, access to justice, access to the profession. But when, when, when we were sitting around the table, it was business as usual. We need to talk about standards. You know how many are standards. <laughs> Empowerment was not in the agenda. So I said to Christine, Christine, we need to do something. This is the, the, the power of you being in charge because you can actually direct the agenda. I said, Christine, we, you know, all these young women are looking at us to say, and then what? We looked and said, how do we make sure that women get empowered? Both attorneys and advocates is to come up with the legal sector code. Fortunately, Christine has done it before in the defense sector, whatever it is. I didn't even know that there was a section nine thing. 
in the BG Act. She said, you know, unfortunately, all these things that have been happening, they were charters. A charter is a statement of intent. Nothing. It's not implementable. They decide, I mean, the law societies had so many charters before, but then we had to look for an instrument that could actually bite. And that was the legal sector code. It's the section nine in terms of the BE Act. The aim of the sector code is that, I mean, the BE Act has all those elements, ownership, management control, and all those seven, sometimes it becomes five, sometimes it becomes seven, you never know where, the, where it is. And we looked at the profession as the legal profession. We, we don't fit in that space. We are not big business because all those elements address issues of black, uh, uh, big business, of, of business, you know, entities. We are a unique sector. We needed to come up with something unique that addresses the needs of the profession. And that was, that's why we came up with the sector code. Fortunately, the act allows us to do that. We, we had to come with unique features to, 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 to convince the minister to say, we need this code because we are not like everybody. Although law is a business, we are all in business, but we are not in business like the other businesses. So that's why we, we came with the legal sector code. And within the legal sector code, we had to, uh, to, to be aware that advocates and attorneys are practicing differently. You can't expect an advocate and measure her or him on management and control. I mean, we are still proprietors. You, you can't have management and control, obviously, and it's the one of those elements that gets higher, you know, ratings. So we had to, unfortunately, you know, formulas, I hate formulas, I hate numbers, but then we had to have a specialist to try and unpack this act. How can we use it to actually make sure that the legal profession fits in? So the code has two sectors. It affects, it, it relates to attorneys, and it leads to advocates. So with attorneys, obviously there are businesses. I mean, there are those top six law firms that we can read them as business. And there are those smaller firms that we, management of government control can't apply to them. So we had to have big exceptions along the way. It was a dirty task, but we, we managed to get it right. I hope it's right, because we hope the Minister of uh, Mr. Minister Patel will gazette it. So I just want to address the issue of the differentiation of advocates and attorneys. We are very well aware of it. So advocates cannot be measured in terms of management, in, many, in terms of board, you know, you are sole proprietors. The only thing that we can manage, measure you with is skills development and enterprise development. The skills we have given a lot of weight on skills development from advocates and the legal sector fund because I was shocked to say, to, to find out that silks don't take people. And for me, it was a bit, you know, awkward because these are the people with all, you know, the, the knowledge. They, they need to be trained. So for, for us to make them participate, we need to we needed to come up with this fund. If you are not training, you are going to contribute to the fund for those who are training young people to be able to. The fund is going to make sure that young people, at least when they start, they get you know, computers, you know, they get uh, you know, the, the tools of trade. Secondly, we are going to ensure that each and every people has a mentor. You know, we, you, are, you are going to force you. We are going to force each and whether you have four or five, whatever you have to eat, do it. Because uh, when you look at the advocate's profession, out of 40, only five can be taken into, into privilege. What happens to all those 300? So we, are, we need to change that narrative. And then when we are going to. Uh, give you points when you prove that you have mentored. Not the normal thing that they tell us, no, I teach in the bars, council and everything, that's, that's your job. We need to do it. <laughs> we need to see how many women you have mentored 
and which type of meters and how far are they. You need to follow your mentee. So this is what it's going to do. Then that's the fund. Let me just say the third one. It's a, you know, it, it, it's, it's very, it, it, it's, it's exciting, you know. But the beauty of it, there'll be a council that oversees this little sector code. You know, I, I was shocked we were talking about competition law now. It was the first time, you know, I mean, the power that I have there <laughs> to demand information from the Department of Trade and Industry. Just give me your stats. From Treasury, give me your stats. You know, and, 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 and I just, and I need the names, I need the amount, and I need the time of, uh, the type of work. And this is what the council is going to do. Because each time they'll tell you when you demand some of the information, no, we need to ask for permission. We can't give you that information. It's private and confidential. So this is basically what the legal sector code aims to achieve. So we've got classes of women, and, and okay, black women will be on top, obviously. How I many black women you trained? I mean, you know, just like that. But it's, it's, it's going to benefit women more than anything. That's why I'm saying that I'm so excited it's going to open the floodgates. But I, I just want to share with you the, the, the painful part. You know, I've been sitting on that thing. The you know, commission will tell you every time she, as she speaks to you, I'm busy with this legal circuit code. The people, I, I, we, we, I can we send it for comments. A flood of comments. A flood of comments. There are comments, some of them just 80 pages. Unfortunately, and I think, I mean, we expected that, but we didn't expect people to be so... I don't know, you know, they were, they were, they are resisting change. And unfortunately, I have to say, it's from advocates' profession. The advocates are resisting that. And the, the authors of those comments are made. You know, you, you, you know and, and each time, uh, at some stage, you want to cry. When a person tells you, you want to, to, to learn, reverse, you know, I mean, this is unconstitutional. Why is triple B not unconstitutional? Why is this particular legal sector code unconstitutional? So it's, it's, we had to spend four months going through those comments, and unfortunately the law wants us to respond and make sure that we respond to those comments. But uh, don't, don't, don't be afraid. I'm excited for women. If, if it gets gazetted, because our aim is to have it gazetted before the end of November, then you will see the fact it's open. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. So if the floodgates are maybe opening there, we've spoken about maybe floodgates potentially having opened a little bit, if not floodgates, but at least some development in the judiciary at an earlier stage. Um, and Tessie, you sit on the Judicial Services Commission, um, and you've seen the candidates that come through, the experience there. And I, I want you to, to talk about, uh, us about a little bit why maybe we've seen the good advances in the judiciary quicker than in practice, but also about what, what the JSC could do to make it easier to pinpoint particular women to come to the bench or to, to have them developed um, and to come prepared before, before the JSC. I have to be careful what I say, because is in the room. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, I think the, maybe let me start this way, the, the statistics that were provided in a project that uh, I'm doing as way looking at issues of transformation and training of uh, junior members at the bar. Uh, as at March, the, the stats that we got were that uh, there were about 250 uh, judges, and of this 250, about uh, 113 are female. And the majority of that is black female. Um, and there's no question that because this is a the, the, the demand or the imperative to transform the bench 
is a legislation uh, driven or it's a demand that arises from, from our legislation. That, that accounts, that must account for, for, the, you know, for the great results that you have seen on the bench over, over the years. It, it's nothing new for us. We inherited as the new members of the, the new additional members of the JSC, we found this great work uh, being done. Now, our experience is the, the applicants that come before you or that come to the JSC are very much a reflection or the kind of applications you get from females are very much a reflection of the exposure of women at the bar and, and, the, and, and the attorney's profession. Uh, the, the quality of candidates that, that present the kind of work. So they tell us what work they have done uh, over the years that they think make them suitable to be on the bench. And, and truthfully, in the more challenging, or in the main, let me say, in the, in the main uh, areas of work, um, there are very few women that present with that kind of experience. Um, I guess in the past, because we needed to rapidly uh, change the face of the bench, certain allowances would be made, you know, uh, potential and, and other considerations. But it's more than 27 years later, um, and, and, and perhaps the demand of can on candidates becomes more different now. Uh, we, we make the assumption, rightly or wrongly, we make the assumption that you've been at the bar for 20 years now, or since 1994, Lindy, come on, you know, you can do better than, than what, you're, what we are seeing and what you are presenting to us. It's slim pickets uh, for the of female candidates when, when they present to us. Uh, it's, not, it's not as if we've got a pool and we debate. It, it is when people are moving from being High Court judge to the SCA to the to the to the Constitutional Court that the job is okay easy it's easier to pick because you get presented with all these wonderful judges to pick from but where you're selecting for for the High Court the candidates that present are exactly what we're struggling with at the bar right which is what's your exposure okay. And the, the problem comes from what do people come in with? What work do they get? And I, and I like saying this. I like saying, uh, and I think it's becoming my, my record played over and over and over, that perhaps we are not conveying enough that the reason you want to brief differently, when we, when we debate briefing patterns, it's not just for the sake of it. It's not, it's not so that I've got more money in my pocket. It's not so that I've got a variety of work, more interesting work to do. It has also to be, and perhaps that should be, the thing that we emphasize, it is what kind of judiciary do you want? Because this is a pipeline to, to, to the bench. And yes, we can, people apply, we can appoint them, but my worst fear always, is that I, on the day that I'm lucky with an insurance matter and I have to appear in court, who am I going to meet? If the assistant judge, the acting judge that's sitting there, do they know anything mm. about this kind of work? My greatest exposure to different kinds of work has been when I'm acting, mm. I have to tell you. That. It's been when I'm acting, uh, where I've been confronted with areas of law, that I really, the last time I heard anything about it was when I was doing my LLB, okay? and, and I have to find my way through, through it. Uh, and so, you know, the JSC, we deal with what we receive. The JPs are responsible for inviting people to come and act. I know how they, maybe because it's very busy, you get all sorts of acting. Uh, and then they think they're ready, they come to the JSC, 
And then the commission is, thinks no. <laughs> <laughs> No, she just now. asks probing questions, that's <laughs> all. And she says, <laughs> well, not, not, not now. Okay. Um, but, but that same candidate, if nothing changes in their practice, they are going to present three years later in exactly the same position. Right? In exactly the same position. So, uh, much as I think the work is as far, I also think that the, the judges may well you know, play, play some role. I know the JP how he at some point, he had an initiative where he, I think, kept stats of who's appearing mm. in what kind of measures. Yes. And, and I think that kind of information from the bench may well serve some, some useful purpose if it is fed back to attorneys and to counsel and they are engaged uh, and guilty. Into, into spreading the work, and not for the sake of it, but for the sake of the bench, because what we select from is a product of, of the training and exposure at this level. Thank you. Thank you. So my male group leader <laughs> has given me instruction. <laughs> no. Um, Everybody's been sitting for quite a while, so we're going to take about a 10-minute comfort break, and uh, there's some snacks here, and then we will resume our discussion. We are, we are forever being careful, but I, and so one of the things that I'm careful about is that we shouldn't make the men feel that this is just bashing of men, and that we are unhappy with the men who are around. There have been wonderful men who played mentorship roles some of them who were my mentors are in, in this room. I just told us I'm sorry he's getting old. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's not about against the men, right? It's, I hope, with the men. Um, and, I, and I think that's quite, quite an important part of what we have to, to talk about. And so I want just to last round to finish all of this off, I thought what we could do is maybe share, if you have a story, a short story, something positive. Because it's not, not the, our experience, we, we often talk about the struggles of the women and how hard it's been, and it, it has been. But there are wonderful positive stories about what we have achieved, and we should celebrate that, and not only look have a story, a something, of a moment where you thought, wow, as a woman, this is, this is something that needs to be celebrated. Um, I, I can think, I'll start so you can be, keep thinking, but when I, for example, saw a picture uh, of, of Komeshni and her team and others appearing before the SCA, where every single council in the matter, on both sides, Reside, you 
Looking at the treasury letters, let's then see appearing complex, very, very complex letters, and you say, oh my goodness, what am I going to do here, you know? So, so, so there are those uh, letters to celebrate, and um, Megan Clavini and Pile, you know, commissioning, we've, we've done some exciting stuff, Marukana, the list goes on and on. But as I say, it's not only about Ceci. Let's replicate and multiply Ceci. She runs a successful practice as a black woman, but we want to see more of Ceci's. And it's through having more of Ceci's and more of uh, Ceci's running successful practices that the pipeline that Ceci spoke to will be effective and the pathway will be an effective one. Thank you. I don't want to give the impression that we have to think very, very hard about this question. <laughs> 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 That's not the case. I must say, um, coming up in the bar, there have been men that have been activists for me, that have put themselves on the line and have said, I want her as my junior because she's good. I've had attorneys who um, have also had to sit and persuade the client. Now that's not an easy thing to do. To sit and say, this is your advocate. There used to be a, a, t a stage where um, a client would walk in um, and he was looking for the advocate. Um, <laughs> this is the advocate. Now, as um, Kathleen said, it's a business. Attorneys want clients. They want to make clients feel good. They don't want to give clients the impression that they're briefing weak people. So those attorneys, those silks, they actually squared their shoulders and said, no, it doesn't matter. Don't worry about the data. Those are the positive stories. Um, and there have been many of them. Many of them. Thank you. I, I, I want to approach it differently. You know, for me, it was a, when, when, when I started my practice, I think it was a student and very energy. We're very energy. And can you That's your mic. Oh, oh, I'll use the other one. That one so maybe is for you. Uh, when I started my practice, there's Justice Mulefe, who's a judge, and Justice Chit in the Court. Mm -hmm. We were very angry. Mm -hmm. We wanted to empower women. All my candidates, I think for 10 years, were women. We used to brief women. I mean, Judge Rita can attest to that. You know, and as time went on, because I was trained, I mean, my, my principal was a maid, and he made me. He made who I am, that's why I'm so vulgar. Because I used to challenge that every time. So, but uh, I'm, I'm saying that forums like this give us an opportunity. I'm, I'm speaking from the side bar and the bar. We need more forums like this, meeting each other and holding each other's hand. Mm. We shouldn't be that. There's this artificial difference mm. between the bar and the side bar, and we need to break it. You know, and, and I'm really excited to see so many main uh, uh, colleagues here. You know, we, we need to pray because the side bar feels they are, you know, they are offense. You know, they are the lowest of the top. So we need forums like this so that we encourage, you know, communication. So I know who to brief. You know, but I need to brief somebody after the legal sector code because I will never empower it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, she spoke about Judge Justice Mulefi, she's now a judge of the Supreme Court of Appeal. And she told me a story the other day, which was completely shocked her. She is a contemporary of Judge Mailula and has be, was in practice for as long as Judge Mailula was in practice when Judge Mailula became a judge. And none of the JPs in Guepe and before in Guepe um, had approached her to come to the bench to even act. She had to wait for 
Judge Malumbo to arrive to give her that opportunity. Where she could have been a judge 10 or 12 years earlier, she had to wait that long to have this opportunity. And a wonderful story is that she's now on the SCA and she's superb. But just being on the SCA now, um, um, I just see the, the impact that the women judges make at that appellate level. You know, where basically um, we are able to now write a dissenting judgment and that dissenting judgment becomes the majority. And for me, it shows what the power of women, um, what, what, the, what power the women will eventually have on the bench. Yeah, so that's positive. Wow. Thank you. Um, for me, there are two highlights. The one is the <coughs> adoption of the maternity leave policy at the bar. Uh, we, women started. Uh, on the back foot on this, where I remember where I was, the group that I started with, uh, the, the standard answer was, no, we are competitors. Why, why, why should I be, be, be contributing and making allowances uh, for someone just because they want to expand their families? Uh, my wife is at home, doesn't work, okay? Then they should do the same. But we got to a point where the policy across the board, you know, became, it became acceptable, not a subject of much debate. For me, that's quite an achievement, and I'm, and I'm happy to have been around to see that. Two, it is the sexual harassment policy and a dedicated committee uh, and desk for that. The ease with which that policy passed, the suggestion firstly, uh, yours here uh, was very much, uh, you know, the driver of, of that, and, and, it, in, and it was adopted with ease. The idea of a funded committee um, and the work that it is doing to, today, for me, that those are, those are two achievements that serve women greatly, and I'm happy to have been part of, of, of the buy at a time when these have been adopted. Thank you. Mike's not working, but I have a voice. <laughs> At first I thought I might open uh, the floor to some discussion, but we ran out of time and you took too long to eat your snacks. <laughs> I'm going to, to finish off. Thank you so much to every one of you for, for making the time for participating. <laughs> and for sharing your stories. Because transformation is not about the numbers. It's not about the mere representation. It's about the fact that for too many people still, women in the legal profession are here to be tolerated, not celebrated. Transformation is not to gradually allow space at the table for the extraordinary women that have elbowed their way in. Women are not, should not, should never have been shackled by expectations of exceptionalism just to have a seat. And in order to make a change, we and you have to tell the stories of the women who have gone before, and the ones who still today stand up to any suggestion that they must be silenced. We are the authors of the fate of those who are yet to come. And therefore, I thank you. Thank you for your example. Thank you for being here. And thank you for showing us the way. <laughs>